But we got Kim Lunatic over in North Korea, you know, playing nuclear uh, roulette. And that's out there. That's the national level and, and the world level. But how about our church family level? We got a WANA starting up, youth programs up again, Wednesday night T Sync. It all means schedule changes, commitment challenges. How about, thank you. Thank you. How about your family? Your marriage? School schedules, curriculum decisions, and praise the Lord, new babies. Cute babies that bring challenging schedules, changes in, in, in changes in schedules. And as do parents who've been reestablished into the area to, in nursing homes. Life happens, doesn't it? That's not verbatim what the bumper sticker says, but you get the idea that life does happen. But life is wonderful. Life's wonderful for most of us, especially in America. God has truly blessed the USA, even though the grand majority of the USA ignores him and worships themselves as the center of the universe. But life happens for everyone. Life happens to reveal the glory of God, to reveal the, his glory as he leads his children through this life victoriously, conquering sin and death and to reveal his glory as he endures and eventually brings judgment upon those who reject his love and trample his holiness underfoot. Charles Spurgeon said, you may readily judge whether you are a ch child of God or a hypocrite, meaning someone playing the Christian game to look good or get, go or get good, by, see, by seeing in what direction your soul turns in seasons of severe trial. The hypocrite flies to the world and finds a sort of comfort there. But the child of God runs to his father and expects consolation only from the Lord's hand. Which brings us to our passage today where the prophet judge Samuel mar marks the difference between how a, God, how a man's man responds to life as it happens and how God's man responds to the same life, to the same stuff. And of course, ladies, just, just so this won't take forever and I don't have to say, you know, a, a God's man slash woman or a man, man slash God, you know, I, we're talking to all of us here, not just the men. The time, here's a little background here. The time is the turn of the first century B.C., a thousand years before Christ. The place is in the highlands of Israel, 3,300 feet above sea level, the promised land. The people are men and women and children like us with weather events and wicked rogue di dictators in the world and enemies and families and new babies and, and elder care and schedules to keep. This isn't a once upon a time in a make-believe galaxy, galaxy. There's no guardians of the galaxy. There's no Avengers here. There's no talking erector sets. Real life, real time, real place, real world. Their world is our world. And it's been about 450 years that they've been governed by prophets and judges gifted to them by God's grace and compassion. Moses led them out of Egyptian bondage for 400 years in 1450 B.C. Joshua took over at the River Jordan around 1400 B.C. to lead them into the Promised Land after their trek through the wilderness. Then 15 more judges, including Samson and Gideon and Othniel and some of those that you've heard their stories, for the next 350 years until Samuel, who wrote or was written about in 1 and 2 Samuel, our part of Israel's life history takes place when Samuel is alive. 
1050 B.C. Like your history and mine, there have been those that walked closely with the Lord, listening to God's word through the prophets, and many, if not most, doing what was right in their own eyes. Chasing off after gods of the world around them and and always wondering why the good God of the Bible always allows bad things to happen to good people. Samuel has been a faithful judge, but his sons have not followed in their dad's example. They're not worthy of following in their father's, their aging father's footsteps. And the enemies of Israel also, primarily the Philistines down the west coast and the Amalekites from the east, are constantly harassing them. Flip back with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Verse 4, you've heard the background, here it is. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. So apparently the elders, this elder leadership, saw things rightly. Verse 3, his son, Samuel's sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after a dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. It was a right thing, a God-glorifying thing for the people to reject corrupt leadership. And it was a right thing for them to take their concerns to their leadership rather than just rebelling against the leadership individually, every man doing what was right in his own eyes. No, no society, Christian or otherwise, thrives long and well under corrupt leadership or individual anarchy. But here's where the difference between a society or a group or a church of man's men and that of God's men separate. By the way, how many of you have heard the term a man's man? Heard of some? What do, you think, what do you think it means when someone says he's a man's man? Help me. Give me some words. What? Strong. Tough. Proud. Doesn't need anybody, anything. Self-reliant. A man, that everybody, a man that every man wants to be, supposedly. A man of the world, a man that has all and needs for nothing. What kind of a king did the people want? Well, let's look down at verse 19, chapter 8. <coughs> Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the nations. <coughs> Excuse me. That our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They wanted a king, a leader to follow. Verse 20, that we may also be like all the nations. They were tired of being holy. They were tired of being set apart. They said the world around us seems to be doing better than us. More success, more prosperity, less suffering. Why can't we be like them? 
and that our king may judge us as opposed to everything being about thus saith the Lord. Give us somebody tangible who we can see walk into his room and hear his judgments and one that could go out before us and fight our battles, probably referring to the cowardice of Samuel's sons. Chapter 7 shows Samuel was very involved physically and spiritually in battle. But worse, it's a, it's a way of saying that the God who has been leading us is not here. He's not with us in our battles. God, God, you're not getting the job done. I pray, I go to church, I toss coins into the plate, I even volunteer for Awana. And my prayers for a job, prayers for less stress, prayers for sick family members, lost family members go unanswered still. Maybe someone else, something else the world has will find my needs, will fill my needs. Does that knock on anyone's door here? Are you ever tempted to lighten up on this holiness thing and cut yourself some slack? Go some places, read some things, do some things, watch some things, hang out with some people you know are not God's standard for your life. That you know one that you know when the world's answers to your problems, that you know the world's answers to your problems are not God's. You know that who you follow is who you will become, right? At Mount Carmel, Elijah the prophet of God gave the people a, a taste test, if you will, when he challenged the 450 prophets of Baal to call out on their God to show his power by sending fire to consume a sacrifice. And they, they came out, 450 of them, on the sacrifice all day long. They were cutting themselves and calling and dancing and singing and just causing up a stir all day long to get their God to bring fire down upon the sacrifice. And finally, Elijah, after goading them a little and said, well, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe you better knock on his door. Elijah just said, you know what? Put my sacrifice out there. Triple the water on the wood. He said one prayer, Lord, show you who you are, and pow, vaporized. And then he said, if the Lord is God, follow him. If anyone or anything else is God, follow that. Who you follow is what you will become. But Joshua 24, 25 says, choose this day whom you will serve. The God of heaven or the God of the world, the God of the nations around us. A man's man, a world's man chooses the gods, the answers to their needs of the world around us. Even after Samuel warn the people that what they were asking for would destroy them. Read that in chapter 8, verses 8 through 18. Their answer was, we don't care. We know what we want. Give us what we want. And that's what God did. And often does with us. He gives us what we want out of either discipline for his children or judgment for his enemies. God chose for them a handsome young man whom his Holy Spirit would equip and empower to prophesy and show courage to lead the army against their enemies and the people were impressed. He was doing everything they wanted and making them like the nations around them including having a leader who was not so gung-ho about waiting on God's prophet Samuel for, to follow the law just exactly. They would say, we, do, we don't have time for the exact sacrifice. We don't have time for prayer and Bible reading. We've got a schedule to keep. That's basically it, 1 Samuel 13. 
And often they, and after they defeated Amalek, whom God told them to destroy completely, including his family and every man, woman, and child in the tribe, and all of their livestock and possessions. Well, Saul had enough common sense or worldly sense to tweak God's plan just a little and spare King Amalek and his family all this wisdom and military help that he might give him and keep some of his livestock and treasures for future barbecues and worship services. I mean, they're really good animals. Why waste them? And that sounded wise. But you know, you you, you can lose a lot of good opportunity by having, by being too gung-ho about holiness. After all, you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good, right? Now, if you don't hear the knock at the door, it could be that you're not at home. It matters that we compromise our church giving in order to have our morning Starbucks. It matters that we can't find time to serve others, but we can find time to to watch the game every time we need to or binge watch every season of Cheers or Beverly Hillbillies or something. (laughs) It matters that we feel nervous about the IRS auditing our income taxes. We Christians have been bought with a price. God gave his perfect son to pay for our sins and conform us into his image, his sacrificial love, his selfless service to people who don't deserve that service any more than you and I do. The people of Israel were being led to physical and spiritual destruction by a man's man of a king whom they had asked for and God could have justifiably said, fine, good riddance. You offended me one too many times. You chose your way over my way and for all I care, hit the highway. Totally just in saying that. But God, out of nothing but pure grace, did not give his people what they deserve, but he turned around and gave them what was best for them in its place. Let's go back to 16 again. Tim masterfully handled this passage last week, and I'm not going to re-preach it, but I want to just fill in where we are. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. This isn't your king. I'm, this is a king God is saying for myself. But Samuel said, How can I go when Saul hears of it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, do you come in peace? And he said, in peace, I've come in sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Then it came about when they entered that he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the finish it. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Next, Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he's tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for he will not sit down until he comes here. 
for we will not sit down. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. While they were yet sinners, while they were still in darkness, enjoying their man's man of a king, God arranged for them a shepherd king from Bethlehem. Interesting. Not a somebody in the world, but a nobody from an insignificant family who was handsome, yes. Some of us just have to struggle with that who was found caring for his sheep when others were either hiding in the luggage, avoiding responsibility. It's where they found Saul. You can read about that in 1 Samuel 10. Or making themselves visible as movers and shakers with leadership potential. Parade me in front. Parade me in front. I'm ready. (laughs) Hit the pause button here. Young people, they found David doing his job out of the limelight. The scriptures say, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, Colossians 3.23. Don't work to be seen by the right people. That's what men's men do because pleasing man or themselves is their reward. When you work hard at a job or school to serve Christ, God will abundantly supply everything that is good for you. And and here's an equation that you'll hear through the rest of the sermon and I hope you'll remember it. You certainly write it down and throw it away later. Everything... Minus God is nothing, equals nothing. But nothing plus God equals everything. Everything minus God equals nothing that's truly good. But even nothing plus God will be everything that's truly good that you need. Let's hit the play button. That was a long pause. So God behind the scenes was providing for the good thing the God's men, man, the people needed rather than the man's man. We now come to the passage that, that Tim read, or that uh, Clint read at the beginning, 1 Samuel 16, 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Stop. Does that sound like the God you serve? That you love? That's not the God that way too many know because way too many serve the God that they want rather than the God who is. Does a good God bring judgment at some point in time for suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and choosing to serve the creation himself or man's men rather than the creator who is blessed forever? Well, you can read about it in Romans 1.18 this afternoon. Does it ever cease to amaze you how we are so quick to justify our judgment and execution of others like for robbing us of our dignity or making us our lives difficult and so hesitant to honor a God who executes judgment on people who ignore, mock, and even work to put him out of sight and mind in the world. Why is it okay for us to say that's enough but not God? 
Does this sound like God removing his spirit from a believer and taking his salvation? Well, every good Bible scholar recognizes from the study of all the scriptures that Saul was empowered by the spirit of God to do what God had chosen him to do. But his life was never indwelt by the Holy Spirit because like David, he was a, because like David, he was a man after God's own heart. He was never indwelt because he was not a man after God's own heart. Man looked and liked the outside of Saul, but God knew his heart. He was from the beginning a man to be a king to make the people of Israel like the other nations, like the world. Matthew 7, 15 and following says, Jesus was talking about a man's men leaders when he said that not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, didn't we not prophesy and worship and do miracles like Saul? Saul could have asked those questions. And the Lord will say, depart from me, you who are doers of lawlessness, because basically you're wolves in sheep's clothing. In John 10, 26, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and I have relationship with them and they with me and, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand, not Satan or anyone else. Read verse 14. And an evil spirit from the Lord then tormented him. Does that say God is evil? No, it says God is sovereign and controls the devil and his angels. You see him handling Job, in, uh, Satan in Job 1. Or yes, Satan wanted to, to harass Job. He wanted to destroy him. He wanted to challenge his faith in God. And God allowed him to do what he may. But he didn't get to do it on his own. We are not in a life and death struggle to see if God will win or Satan will win. Or God will win and man will win. Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord has made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Matthew Henry said that they drive the good spirit away from them, do, uh, they that drive the good spirit away from them do, of course, become a prey to the evil spirit. There's no neutral ground there. If God and his grace do not rule us, sin and Satan will have possession of us. It's only in our country where you can vote undecided. No such vote in heaven. Pause button again. To whom are you looking for, looking as your king? To whom are you looking as your king? Where has your vote been cast? Do not ignore the knocking here. If you are not a believer, you are under the rule of Satan and hell. It's not good news, but it's true news. God is allowing you to have what you want. Everything minus God. But the equation says that equals nothing good. You say, I like my life. I'm doing fine without God. Well, maybe fine for now. But go to a cemetery and see where every life that ever lived eventually goes. It dies. And God says that it is appointed for men once to die, and after this, a second chance. That's not what it says. It is appointed for men once to die, and then comes judgment. You will die. Everything fine for now 
minus God equals nothing. No joy, no pleasure, no love, no forgiveness, no comfort, no end, forever. But even nothing for now, some struggles, some pains, plus God equals everything good forever. So how do you want to spend forever? Back to the text. Verses 15 through 17. Saul's servants then said, And behold now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a, a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you that he shall play the harp with his hand and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. They could see that the spirit was spiritual, that God was the answer, but their answer was, hey, put on some good tunes, man. Get some good music. By the way, we need to always be praying for our worship team members because the power of music is awesome. It has the power to bring people, to help bring people to the throne of grace. But it has the power to lead people right to the gates of hell. What's on your radio? Music's powerful. We need to pray for those who are involved with it including ourselves. How many times do we medicate ourselves with good creations of God, like music, and not God himself? Fellow believers, this is us too. Did God this time take his presence totally away, giving them only what they wanted? No. No. Luckily for them, one of the young men in the conversation just happened to know about a great musician, no doubt practiced hard and long, who also happened to be known as, verse 18, a mighty man of valor, taking risks because God doesn't take risks. He's courageous, a warrior, and Goliath hadn't even happened yet, prudent in speech, Pause, knock, knock. Does God have your tongue? It can be an instrument of wisdom and encouragement, and it can be an instrument of foolishness and gossip. Who is king of your tongue? Out of Jesus' words, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the help me. Heart. Matthew 12, 34. A man's man speaks to be cool with the world around him. God's man speaks to glorify God and edify others with his hope and God's wisdom. Do you know God's hope? Are you regularly studying his wisdom? Let's hit the play button. Go on with the list. The man God provided was, and a handsome man. Doesn't mean he was gorgeous. The ESV says, a man of good presence. That's a good translation of it. A well-preserved, a well-presented man. It is not holy to not care how you look to the world around you. Slovenliness is not holiness. It is holy for you for how you dress and act to honor the beauty of Christ. Because it's about, it's not about our beauty, but Christ's beauty that we're pointing to. Verse 18, and here's the biggest difference between Saul and David, between a man's man and God's man. The Lord was with him. 
It wasn't just the Holy Spirit coming upon him two or three times in his life to, to get something done, to overpower an army, to, to get him to, to be uh, verified as, as a prophet. The Holy Spirit indwelt David, heart and soul, outwardly and inwardly. David would be a great king, God's king of choice, because God possessed his everything. He would be called a man after God's own heart and become a preview of the good shepherd king that God would send to lay down his life for his people in Jesus. It is the life of that God's man that we will be studying in the coming months, the life of David. But for today, and each day, each moment after this, you and I will be called to answer the question to what kind of king are you going to follow? This afternoon, in my next response to what you just told me that really ticks me off, what kind of servant are you going to be? A man's man, everything, now, minus God, or God's man, where even nothing plus God equals everything that is good for you. Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you so much for these people. Lord, for their ears, for their, for their eyes, for their minds, Lord, that not that you gave them to me, but that you opened them. There are ears that are open, and hopefully, Lord, some, some ears that are open that weren't open when they came here, that have seen a Savior that they did not know existed. Lord, certainly we, we all realize that we aren't what we ought to be, and sometimes we aren't what we want to be. But so many people don't know that you gave your son so that we might be known and equipped to become everything that you want us to be and everything that is good for us and everything that really brings true joy, eternal love, eternal pleasure. Father, I... I, I Thank you for your word, for your wisdom. Lord, this, these are not the words of men. They are the words of a holy God who has been so patient with not only the world that he rejects him, but even his people, even his children, whom we, we, are, not always, we, are, we are not always lined up to, to be who you want us to be. Lord, we are, we are distracted by things that don't really matter. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill your people here with a resolve to, to fix our eyes on you and to hear your voice and to, and to make you our king daily. And Lord, that someone here that is not yours, that, that their heart would be changed to follow you. I thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.